So, do you have an official title? Number one Beatles braid? Do you, do you eschew all of that kind of stuff? I eschew it. Okay. Um, th- there isn't a title. I mean, who, who, could, be, who could bestow such a title? <laughs> um, no, there isn't one and that's fine. Okay, that's fine. great. But, um, I mean, I've always been a, a Beatles fan for as long as I can remember. Um, been a keen fan of your books and, and, and reading as much as I can about them. Um, our podcast, as you know, is about copyright uh, yeah. and about how copyright intersects with people's lives. So the place we wanted to start, really, is the, the Beatles then and copyright. So um, reading some of the interviews, uh, the interview you did with Paul McCartney and other things you've picked up in your book, um, there are some comments about copyright, the deals they did, how they finally, when they first started understanding what the implications were yes. for them as songwriters <clears throat> and performers. So can you... Tell us a bit about when the Beatles first became aware of copyright and publishing. Yeah, the, f- the first time that they any of them signed a, a copyrighted a document regarding copyright was in Germany in 1961. Mm. They were over there, the Beatles were there to play a season at the Top Ten Club, which ended up being for three months. And during the course of that, they were seen by a German musical arranger, conductor, composer called Bert Kampford. And Bert wanted to record them. Actually, he primarily wanted to record a singer called Tony Sheridan. But on stage in the club, the Beatles were his backing group. They had their own acts and their own set, and they backed Tony. And because Tony would need backing on record, it was the Beatles were invited to the studio as well. Uh, and while they were there, they recorded a tune that George and John had cooked up between them, an instrumental, um, which had a couple of names, but went eventually under the title of Cry for a Shadow, being a bit of a pun on the Shadows instrumental group. And so at the end of uh, the session, when they were signing, they, they signed a contract with Burt Camford in order to allow him to release the record uh, if he wanted to. Nothing was compelling him to re- release it, but they obviously did sign a document. And also because this was an original composition, they had they were shown a publishing contract, um, and uh, this was something that was entirely in German. <laughs> uh, and George and John, as the co-composers, signed it without having any sense of what it said. Presumably, they knew some German at that stage, mostly fairly ribald. Things. <laughs> they would have known a little bit of German from being in the club. They used to know every every night at 10 o'clock on, in the red light district. Um, that's not quite strictly right, but in the area where they were playing the Raper Barn, mm. uh, you had to leave the clubs if you were 18 year, if you were younger than 18 years old. Mm. And the, the house lights would go up and the band would have to stop playing and someone would announce over the tannoy this thing in German about all those under 18 must leave. The house vice control a, and uh, and they heard it every night, and so they memorised it. They knew that, but I don't think that was of much help to them <laughs> when they were with the regarding contract. regarding this document. And so John and George just signed it, and that was that. And similarly, they all signed the recording contract with Burt Kampfer without having any knowledge of what that said either. Um, and that's what young artists will do mm-hmm. um, because they want to have their sound on a record. But doubly compounded, where a legal contract to a to a young yeah. performer and musician is something that they would maybe scan read, but in their case, it was doubly hard for them to understand the implications of it. Yeah, it would. It, it turns out that it was a standard contract, yeah. and there would have been no varying of the terms allowed anyway. Mm-hmm. So it wouldn't have been it made any difference if it was English and they had read it, yeah. because they would have if if they had challenged any of it, which they probably wouldn't have done their challenges would have gone unheeded because these were standard terms. Um, In that respect, however, they were fortunate in that because they didn't know what they were signing, they were lucky that they didn't sign away more than they did. Mm -hmm. But that contract, both those contracts actually did come back to trouble them later. They then wished they hadn't signed them, but Mm -hmm. they had signed them. And in fact, in the Beatles' history, they're part of the process of what goes forward. A comes before B and B comes before C and they're a part of that so they needed to be there in order for everything else to happen yeah so Paul in the interview you did with him for the recording sessions uh, refers to that song and says at that point they were you know they felt that you know, 
they didn't they weren't aware of copyright they weren't aware of publishing they just felt that songs existed in the air and they were and the publishers saw them coming um in tune in you you question that narrative and yeah yeah what what what, what were you suggesting there well yes i don't think they were as naive as paul makes out mm. um because they're very bright young guys they obviously didn't have a sense of the way the music business worked but they were not completely ignorant because they've been looking at record labels for years and Paul has often said how much they did look at labels and record labels would have certain bits of information on them uh, and that would include publisher names mm -hmm. so they would have seen these names and they probably had some sense because they mixed with other musicians who had recorded who had written mm -hmm. and they probably would have heard by now that there are there's a thing, the copyright in the song is different from the copyright in the recording. Yeah. I can't believe they were completely unaware of that. Um, and also they looked at the music papers quite thoroughly. And in those days, publishing was such a, a key part of the music business that they would have seen lots of advertisements from publishers and lots of articles about publishers. And though I'm sure they were not that familiar with it, they, I don't think they were completely unaware of it. But that's a really interesting time, isn't it, where publishing, as we would think about publishing as producing printed materials and sheet music, it was at that point had started to switch around to where the recorded medium was the thing and yes. the publishing kind of was being pulled along in the wake of that. Yes, yeah. that, that's exactly right. And the Beatles accelerated that as they accelerated so much else as well. Mm. Uh, but... The, the history of the recording industry is that is it's technology driven, of course, because you know the invention of recording machines, uh, of gramophones, um, was 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 crucial to that development. But before that, song music existed as songs. It was sheets of music. It was called sheet music, and and a song would be composed, and it would go down on a piece of paper, and then it would be sold as a piece of paper to people who would play in their homes or in on bandstands or wherever it might be and that's the origin of music publishing and the record business developed secondary to that and obviously they had to have a key relationship with publishing so for there were numerous decades until the 60s when the, rec the record business was absolutely hand in hand with, with the publishing business and you needed the two always for anything to happen and for example, George Martin's job before he met the Beatles was to, his job was, it was called A&R Man, Artist and Repertoire. He would find the artist and then he would go and find the repertoire. Well, the only place to find the repertoire was by going to the music publishers. So George Martin's job was to know all the publishers and to know and to be available for them to say to him, George, we've got a song that might suit one of your artists. And George would be plied with demos, all a and R men plied with demos of songs all day long and lunches and gatherings of all kinds in order that he can be exposed to the song that he might then give to Matt Monroe or whoever it might be, one of his artists, and there were many of them who needed a song. And that was always, and then he would arrange the studio and he would speak to the musical arranger, the conductor, typically there would be an orchestra of some size, and get the singer in for a three hour session and that and at least one other title would be recorded from start to finish in those three hours. So that was the job of George Martin. When the Beatles came along, they were they changed that completely because they didn't need him to find a song and they didn't need him to bring in other players. They were a self-contained unit. Here's the song, we'll play it, you record it. So that, that threw everything on its head right there. I mean, there were other, obviously other acts before the Beatles, but even in the sense of Cliff Richard and the Shadows, Norrie Paramore, their A&R man, would find them the songs. And, and Norrie would say to Cliff, I think this one will suit you. And Cliff would listen to it and go, well, if you think so, OK. And he'd record it. Um, but the Beatles came in and said, this is the song we're going to do. And obviously that required flexibility on the part of their A&R man. And in George Martin, they had the most flexible man imaginable because he was willing to listen to anything that worked. It was an amazing combination of those characters. 
George did try to get them to perform um, How Do You Do It, didn't he, with the, the Mitch Murray song, and they yeah. tried it, and uh, yeah. it didn't really work out. Although it kind of did work out, didn't it? Because they, they arranged it and performed it. They said, actually, we don't want that. And they yeah. gave it to Jerry and the Pacemakers, who yeah. had the hit. It ended up being a happy story. Um, both Jerry, uh, Jerry took it to number one. Yeah. Um, but you see, that is, that's an example of what it was the Beatles changed, because initially, when George Martin didn't believe they had any self-composed songs that were worth releasing. Um, he said, well, this is what you will do. You go away and learn this and gave them how do you do it uh, on a disc, an acetate disc. And they went away and learned it. And they, as, as they would, they re uh, rearranged it to suit their style, but they still didn't want to do it. They did do it because they had to do it, but they didn't want to do it. And for a number of reasons, which are quite convoluted, uh, George Martin was persuaded that it couldn't come out. And the Beatles always thought that it was their powers of persuasion that had won the day, but in fact, in reality, it was nothing to do with them. It was other people pressing George away from it that made, it, made him drop it. Really? Yeah. So, senior people within EMI Parlophone? Well, or? chief among them, the composer, Mitch Murray, okay. he didn't like what the Beatles had done to his song. And, um, and wouldn't sign the publishing contract uh, until he was happy with the recording because he was quite savvy. Yes. Mitch was a beginner, but he, he, he was savvy. And of course, composers and songwriters, as copyright nerds will know, <laughs> have that first writer ref refusal on the first release of a recording. Once yes. that first recording's come out, yes. then anyone else can do their cover versions yes. and it has to be licensed. Especially as in his case, he hadn't yet signed the publishing contract. Right. Mm. So it was an unpublished song and no one could do anything with it. Very few writers had that sense to, to, to keep rights back uh, while, they, while, it was, while they were within their control, but he did. Because there's a tendency to think that back in that time, everything was the Wild West and that almost, you know, there, there were no business rights restrictions on what happened, but clearly not the case at all. I mean, no. maybe people don't think that, but in my mind, I think, well, you know, things happened and it was almost nobody had control over it, but clearly that was happening. It was a business, it was a business that had been set up for, for many years, but actually it was shifting at that time. Yeah, it wasn't really the Wild West at all. It was no. all done very procedurally. Okay. And um, uh, amongst, you know, as a, as, a, as a part of what I do is to uncover as many documents mm. as I can that are original to the period. And I've seen great screeds of correspondence between record companies and music publishers and music publishers and broadcasters. And they were all in the game together. And it was all quite formal and civilised. Um, ultimately, the, at the end of the day, um, those who wrote the songs, unless the songs were especially successful, would derive quite little income from them um, because there were so many other people taking their cut. Uh, so uh, maybe I'm thinking more about what was happening in America and particularly with uh, black musicians and what was oh, happening well. there, which is a whole different scene. So the, at that time, the publishing in the UK was operating according to a different it, it, it was a bit more of an old gents game in the UK. Yeah. In the US, um, it was more like the Wild West. I mean, that was a, that's an incredibly interesting period of popular music development, mm. is that period of the first few years of rock and roll, coming out of rhythm and blues and jazz and all of those things. Mm. Because whereas in Britain we had a great many record companies, but the market was completely dominated by two, and and... Decker and EMI who had 80% of the business and the other 20% was in the hands of not many other companies either so a handful of companies really had more than 90%. In America, although there were big companies, Columbia and RCA Victor and so on, there was also this incredible um, number of independent record companies that were just based in towns and cities all over the United States. Um, and which had picked up distribution wherever they could and got airplay somehow or other on commercial stations, uh, often using payola. And, and, that, and the, the, the business was full of incredible characters, dangerous characters, likable characters, um, very dodgy characters, very honest characters, very dishonest characters. And that was much more wild than the British scene, which was, which was because it's a smaller country, and particularly London-centric, um, didn't have any of that, really. And one of the things that happened in that world was 
people ending up on the credits of the song yeah. that clearly had tangential, if any, real involvement in the writing of it. Yeah, that was part of the payola process. Was yeah. that um, someone, if they, you know, are, are it, as an incentive to play the record, well, we'll put your name down as co-composer. You'll get half the copyright proceeds from yeah. it, mm. and that would be really tough on the man or woman who had written the song in the first place, who would find a, something they'd solely created, having, you know, having to surrender a share, not only in the credit but in the revenue. And that was that was pretty commonplace, and it was commonplace here, in a certain way. Um, record producers A and R men um, would uh, quite often the unscrupulous ones would insert their name as composer, or they would write a song quite legitimately, but make sure that an artist recorded it, mm-hmm. and the artist had no choice but to record it, and then that would end up on the B side, mm. um, and because of the way that mechanical royalties were calculated, the composer of the B-side would earn as much from record sales as the composer of the A-side. So um, unfortunately, that, that was quite rife as well. And George Martin, he, he was one of the few who didn't do that, although he did have a few things going on because you kind of, everyone, they these producers weren't on um, percentages of record sales right. so they would find some other way of getting a percentage and that was one of the ways of doing it and George Martin did it a bit but he had colleagues who did it a lot more so in terms of writing credits that's one of the most well known parts of the Beatles story isn't it the ordering yeah. of Lennon McCartney yeah. McCartney mm-hmm. Lennon um, I noticed actually an inconsistency rereading your interview with Paul his memory is that he wrote uh, Cry for a Shadow with George um, that's what it says in the interview anyway but it Does says it? Uh, it, I've got it here we can have a look at it if you like but, um, the, the, the thing I wanted to, in that case the, the, the contention was well actually George wrote the guitar solo therefore he's not he's not he's not a writer of it um, but the, yes. I, I guess yeah. the question is at that time you know that borderline between composer and performer was breaking down because these were created in a band context so do you want to tell us a bit about that whole credit thing how that developed over time yes mm. uh, I know what you're talking about you're talking about a song called In Spite of All the Danger ah, I am misremembering yeah um, which was at that time when I interviewed Paul I hadn't heard it but I knew he had the recording of the Quarrymen uh, making it in 1958 um, and at that point I didn't even think I would ever get to hear it but now it's it's everywhere thankfully um, yeah, that went down as well. Lennon, John Lennon, um, okay, I'll, I'll trace this right back, but I'll try to be brief. One of the very many remarkable things about Lennon and McCartney's meeting is that Paul, at the age of 14, had started to compose music, um, and John, at the age of 15, had started to write songs. Uh, they both had songs. John had a song called Hello, Little Girl. And Paul had a song called I Lost My Little Girl. Funnily enough, both had Little Girl in the titles. And they were doing this themselves, without reference to anybody else. Uh, And they didn't necessarily announce it very much because it's just like, you know, you go to school and say, I wrote a song. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, I, you know, I I make model planes, you know, (laughs) or whatever it might be. Um, But when they met, they are, they got along very well and I don't know exactly what the interlude was but quite soon afterwards when they were talking each revealed to the other that they had written a song and, and oh you've written a song oh, I've written a song and so they started to write songs together and that's a miracle in itself right there there were so few kids writing songs anywhere in the UK uh, in the city of Liverpool there weren't there wouldn't have been many 14 15 year olds doing it they were both in the same part of the city really they were just a couple of miles apart so uh, that was remarkable and they started to write songs and they hit upon this idea of, of writing another Lennon and McCartney original on every page uh, and that was based on Rogers and Hammerstein uh-huh. because you would get two names on a great piece of music, would often have two names, Lerner and Lowe, Rogers and Hart, Rogers and Hammerstein. And so Lennon and McCartney was their version of that. Um, and they stopped writing, it didn't mean they had to write everything together, but it meant that whatever they wrote, they would put both their names on it. 
Um, they they stopped writing songs for a while, but when they resumed in '62, they resumed that arrangement. And then when they've got a record coming out and they're going to be signing their first publishing contract, they had a meeting in what was Brian Epstein's uh, apartment or flat, really, in Faulkner Street in Liverpool, where John was living with his wife at that time, Cynthia. And John, Paul, and Brian had a meeting to discuss this thing because the Beatles have got a contract as a group but now there's another contract that exists on the side which is for two of them only, Lennon and McCartney and they decided that they would formalise that agreement of both their names being on everything they did um, and by the look of it, the best I can make it out is that they agreed that they would alternate the credit from McCartney Lennon to Lennon and McCartney and McCartney Lennon to Lennon and McCartney why I don't know, it's a bit mad, but they did that. And the first song ended up being through mistakes, Lennon McCartney. It was meant to be McCartney Lennon. So they switched it to the next one that was McCartney Lennon. And if you trace the publishing credit on the composer credit on 1963 records, it keeps fluctuating. <laughs> and then from the second half of the year, particularly the autumn onwards, it becomes fixed as Lennon McCartney. Paul maintains that that is the result of the holiday that John took with Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager. Um, but I'm not, he's entitled to his point of view, I'm not too sure that the facts back that up because they continued to be McCartney Lennon and Lennon McCartney switching for quite a few months after that. Right. And it eventually it's by the autumn that it becomes Lennon and McCartney. Was it just possibly as simple as alphabetical? <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul says it's because Paul also says it's because John shouted louder and because it's my name first, right? Because he did have that kind of dominance within their own two-way friendship. Mm. Um, but it does it rolls off the tongue better and it is mm. alphabetical, which means it's kind of not biased. Mm. Whereas if it's McCartney Lennon, then it's clearly a decision. Lennon McCartney being alphabetical takes that out of the equation. It's just alphabetical. Much like Morris and Secca, really. Yeah, a little bit. We, we had this dispute at great length. It was a we dispute, were, it was a well, conversation, discussion. It? Yeah, yeah. How, how we were going to credit joint authored work between us um, and whose name should go first. And yeah. we, you know, we feel it is a work of joint authorship, everything we do. We know yes. that one of us does certain things better and slightly than the other, but rather than have that debate every time, and it's different in, you, in academic... You were quite drawn by this idea of it, it being like <laughs> a Lennon and McCartney sort yeah. of thing. But well, you would be, wouldn't you? <laughs> I, I, I might be influenced. Mm. But the, I, I, for academia, it's a, it's a big issue because the person who comes first, their name's there. Mm. And you often have this with multiple authored works. You have this ordering of the names, which mm. is quite a sort of outdated well no it's, it's still a strong convention it is. and there's there's work to be done to, to change that and you've got these different taxonomies of what contribution people made yeah. to the thing um, because they're not all authors and certainly on a scientific paper they're not all the authors they're people working on a project yes. and I guess the, the same principle really does might do well to apply to pop music because that issue that you've created clearly created divisions within the Beatles as a unit and we've got other bands that have come afterwards that have said well we'll share you know we know that you know Coldplay for example Chris Martin is the sort of primary songwriter but he he I think as I understand it accepts Cold, those songs wouldn't exist in the way they exist they wouldn't be as popular he wouldn't enjoy what he does as much if he didn't have the rest of the band so they say right let's split it yes I mean is that something that the Beatles ever considered were there was it George saying, hang on, or, or even Ringo saying, hang on, shouldn't we have a slice of this pie? Paul uh, has a, a memory of walking with John, funnily enough, near to the place where they met in Walton in South Liverpool, where they decided that they would exclude George. I'm not even sure that Ringo was part of the band yet, um, or the group as they were, but... Um, but you know, let's just keep it as Lennon and McCartney. Let's not extend it to a third person. And George wasn't much contributing anyway to the songs. But what would happen, of course, is that because the studio was like a workshop, and because they would be taking songs in that hadn't ever been recorded by anybody before, because they'd just written them, it was only in the act of of quickly working out parts that things would change and that George and Ringo did both make a contribution in many instances to the song. 
not everyone, um, but to many of them and it very quickly became lost of who contributed what that line was my idea or that the way we end it that I thought of that that never got written down and it tends not to be on the tapes because they would switch tapes off between takes so you don't get to hear a lot of the dialogue in the studio there's some but not a lot so um, in later years I think probably even at the time um, George and Ringo felt that, well, you know, we helped, but we didn't get our name on it. And that meant they didn't get a share of the revenue. And within the Beatles, there was, um, the Beatles as a collective group split everything four ways. And their collective income was quite significant because of their recordings selling so well and because of their concert revenue. So there was a lot of projects that happened, their films and so on, that, that were split four ways. But Lennon and McCartney had the music publishing income as well. George had a dribble of that. And Ringo had half a dribble. Um, but Lennon and McCartney just, the money poured in. Mm -hmm. And so two of the Beatles were far, far wealthier than the other two. And um, that was just an inevitability of, of the fact that they wrote the songs. And a song like She Said, She Said, which is the song where there was a row, Paul said he didn't like the arrangement. As I understand it, there may have been a, some division between the band because they were taking acid and Paul wasn't doing that at that mm. point so they mm. finished this kind of proto-psychedelic proto rock track and George was quite heavily involved in that I mean yeah. do you sense that there was a, a falling out over that or something because George was also quite uh, he felt his, his, his songwriting wasn't really getting recognised or having a gap to yeah. put his, his thing in there wasn't he there's a lot of stories uh that one could talk about and just in the things that you said mm. um, I, they, they did argue the Beatles but they, they, they got on better than any band ever I would say I mean the remarkable chemistry between them all they were always for the common purpose it always all for one and one for all um, and, and as we see from the Get Back films that Peter Jackson made the Beatles were whoever it was any one of them was receptive to the ideas of others and indeed, even to people who happen to be in the room who might have something to say and, and felt free that they could say it. Um, but they weren't going to keep ad adapting, adjusting the credit. Um, we don't really know what happened. We don't really know what happened at that She Said, She Said session. There are speculations and, and uh, it, it would be dangerous, I think, to put too much weight on them without anything to back them up. But... Um, George did feel overlooked. He was beginning to come to the, the fore more as a composer. Initially, he was some way behind Lennon and McCartney um, and didn't have, at that time, their natural ability to compose very easily. Um, and so his initial songs weren't regarded as highly as Lennon and McCartney songs. Uh, and he did also have a song or two, certainly one that we know of, that was rejected by the group. So he he... Though he looked back on that period later with some resentment because he hadn't been nurtured, perhaps, um, it wasn't quite like that in reality. I mean, they were going to record an album and who's got songs and John, John will come up with this one and Paul will come up with that one. Often John and Paul would have songwriting sessions before the album sessions began out at, Paul's, out at John's house or upstairs at Paul's house. George typically wasn't part of those. So it was a bit of a carve up, but I mean, it created the most phenomenal artistry and you wouldn't want to change anything looking back on it. But, but obviously there was a bit of a casualty there. And in later years, George would say that he felt disrespected to an extent. Mm -hmm. And he probably was. The get back footage is just fascinating, isn't it? Just yeah. to see what they're like and to have expected... For all, you know, all our lives we've been waiting to see that, haven't we? Yeah. And there it is, and it's like, uh, and some people say it's boring, and it's like, well, no, that's that's just life. That's what their lives were like. It's, and you're right there in the room, and you can see those relationships, and I know that everyone's talking about it online, but yeah. I just, I still find it, I think you said even before that film was going to be released, that's going to change yeah. everything. Yeah, I knew it would. Any exposure to the Beatles is educational. And that is an almost eight hour exposure uh, of the closest kind we've ever had. 
to them interacting and their creative process. We see it right in front of our very eyes. Uh, it's all happening right there and the cameras caught it and the sound recordists caught it. And yes, it's breathtaking. We, we've had nothing else like it. We've had glimpses of creative process before, but nothing else like that. So did you know it was coming? I mean, were you, did you have insights and that that, that was going to be... be being uh, put together in that way were you involved in any way i wasn't involved in it at all um i got my name on the credit for in the part one but i really wasn't involved in it and um but i knew it was coming because they announced it mm, about three I, I can't remember exactly when about three years ago it was it was meant to happen before covid yeah or well, it's going to happen in late 19 late 20 but was being worked on from 18 i think 2018 I listened, what I did know was that I, I immersed myself in the source material that Peter Jackson had to use, in mm. fact he had more than I listened to, but I had a lot of what he had to listen to and to use. And once I immersed myself in that, I knew that his telling of the story was going to completely change our view of what occurred in that month, uh, because I heard it, I heard the same thing. And uh, it was a complete revelation to me. And I knew that therefore it would be a complete revelation with whatever he did with it. But of course, what he did was something wonderful anyway. Mm. So yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful. And perhaps a and source for you as well? Oh, for your massively. Work as well. Yeah. Yeah, no perhaps about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my job is to, I spend all my life really looking for little, little bits of knowledge that will add to what I already know and that I can pass on to the public through my books to add to what they already know and there is the most massive helping <laughs> of it ever mm -hmm. you know I'm looking for li this line or that line and mm -hmm. there's like eight hours of footage that you can just stare at mm -hmm. and, and see so much mm -hmm. you know I've done it I've viewed it complete four times now and I'm still seeing things fresh but Dick James um, arrives yeah. in that doesn't he he yeah. comes and he's got their the information about their publishing yes. because they, they've got a whole load of catalogues for them as publishers is that yes that's right so. yes uh, Dick James is the Beatles music publisher mm. he has been since since 1962 and we ought to talk about that um, but he arrives uh, at the studio with a list of songs in a, a music publishing company called Lawrence Wright which has been up for sale music publishing catalogues frequently come up for sale. Um, these days they're hoovered up by pretty much just the one or two giants that exist out there. But in those days there were a great many, like book publishing, a great many independent, small independent companies that would have a catalogue of copyrights um, uh, and they would sometimes come to the market for the, the death of a composer or the death of the publisher or whatever it might be. They would be realised for cash and could be bought by other companies and Northern Songs, which was John Lennon and Paul McCartney's publishing company, managed by Dick James, um, was in the business of looking around to see what else they could add to their catalogue because it wasn't just going to be Lennon and McCartney songs. And uh, Northern Songs, uh, under James's stewardship, bought Lawrence Wright. And what you see in the film is Dick arriving at the studio saying, You've, you are now part owner of these songs. And they're looking through the songs and of course they know only a few of them mm. because they're quite arcane songs from Lawrence Wright was I believe I'm right in saying was one of the great original music publishing entities um, something about him being in Blackpool selling sheet music's in the back of my mind he's an he was an original it wasn't he I think I'm right in saying it wasn't even his real name I might be confusing, I could quickly look it up, but anyway, it was a substantial catalogue and they now owned it. And that's what you see on camera. And, jo and there's a delightful moment when, when Paul sees that Carolina Moon is in there, which was always his, his uncle's great song at the Liverpool parties when everyone's bevied up and they're all singing songs. Because their exposure to music was really the old fashioned exposure. You know, pianos in the parlour was how they grew up, particularly Paul. And so family party always had a piano. Wouldn't be someone playing MP3 files. It would be someone <laughs> sitting at the piano, usually his father, yeah. Jim Mack, playing the songs. And that was his uncle, Uncle, who is it, Uncle Ron, does he say? Um, who sang Carolina Moon. And Paul does that great impression in the moment. 
being a great mimic that he is of his of his bevied scouse uncle doing Carolina Moon, <laughs> mm. and now he owns it or a part owns it. So Dick James, that is a, a very interesting story, is, isn't it? Uh, he's um, in Rocket Man, the, the Elton John biopic. Stephen Graham plays quite a, a sort of grotesque version of him. I, I, is that really what he was like? He, he comes across in that film as sort of a foul-mouthed, mm. um, sort of almost semi-gangster. But he, he have, his son, I think, has objected to that. Um, way in which he was represented mm. and said he was he was a soft-spoken old-fashioned music man but yeah can you tell us something about his his story because there was some development over the beatles wasn't there and the corporation of apple and what happened there yes um gosh okay um the the, the portrayal of dick james in rocket man is, is utterly outrageous and really disgusting okay. i mean just a disgraceful thing to do um whether that was elton Wanting it that way, or the director or the writer, I do not know. It, it doesn't matter whose decision it was. I guess Elton could have vetoed it. Um, maybe it's an indication of Elton still being bitter about Dick James, um, but it took about a, dis a distortion of history. I mean, I have a lot of problems with biopics generally, and that's one of the reasons why, because you can really distort true events. The man that we see in that film is foul-mouthed and lewd and just scurrilous. And the real Dick James was, I don't believe he ever swore, so that's number one. He wasn't foul-mouthed, he wasn't lewd. He was a respectful old gent of the music business who was born in, I think, 1920, if I'm getting my facts right from memory. Uh, in the east end of London to immigrant parents uh, from Poland, Russia, Jewish, um, real name Isaac Vapnik, uh, had quite a nice singing voice. Everyone said you should go on the stage. This was the 1930s. He, he, he was, a, as a young man, he started a career as a singer and did pretty well. I mean, there's a lot of people out there singing and he got himself recorded. He had a big hit in America, which probably profited him by no more than a shilling or two. Um, he uh, was on television. He had his own radio show on Radio Luxembourg. He was established. He toured. He did one night stands and charity shows and all of that, all the things you would do. But the business was changing and he was getting older and he lost his hair and he wore a wig and his time was passed. And so in the 1950s he went into music publishing because he knew he'd spent his whole career being given songs and working hand in hand with publishers. And so he went behind the desk, left the stage and went behind the desk, um, carried on recording a bit. He had, his biggest hit was Robin Hood which was the theme music of the ITV adventure serial from 1956-57. And um, but Was that the one that Monty Python parodied with the... Dennis, Dennis Moore. Moore. Dennis yeah. Moore, Dennis Moore riding through the... Day. the Lupins, yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes, exactly, the Lupins. Um, so he had that here, and, and George Martin was his record producer, his A&R man. Uh, and they had a very good relationship, which is germane to the Beatles' involvement with Dick. But um, he went behind a desk, he went behind the desk of Sidney Bron, um, quite a good independent publishing company, Tim Pan Alley, mm. you know, Charing Cross Road, Denmark Street. And then eventually by 1961, Dick decided to set up his own company with the blessing of Sidney Bron. They had a good relationship still. And uh, Sidney Bron being the father of Eleanor Bron, the actress the comedian. I still use old fashioned terms. That might make me sound sexist. I'm not. I'm just steeped in the word actress, not actor for a woman. So that's why I still use it. Um, so he set up his own company with the intention of only using British songwriters. He wanted to promote British. Like a lot of children of immigrants, he was fiercely pro-British pro because Britain had given him a home, his parents a home. And he was very patriotic about Britain. And when John Lennon and Paul McCartney came along through George Martin mentioning Dick James to Brian Epstein, he ends up publishing Please Please Me and Ask Me Why. Um, it's perfect for Dick because they're young, they, they're original and they're English. 
and this is exactly the kind of material he's looking for and so a, a, a relationship begins with Dick and Lennon and McCartney and to go back to what you were saying earlier Paul says we thought songs were in the air and anyone could own them well they had to sign a publishing agreement with Dick James for those two songs and it was the template agreement what's called the 10 50 50 contract 10 percent sheet music 10 percent of sheet music proceeds 50 percent share of mechanical royalties which includes radio airplay and 50 percent of proceeds that come in from any sub publishing deals overseas 10 50 50 and this contract was unchangeable by certainly unchangeable by complete beginners um, but also unchangeable anyway it was the, it was the agreement that had been um, hammered out with the songwriters guild so it was it had the approval of songwriters they may not have profited from songs as much as they would have wanted to but it was what you signed if you wrote a song and the copyright would pass in perpetuity to the publisher and um, henceforth please please me and ask me why we're Dick James music and that's how they remain except that it's changed in the last couple of years which we might or might not come to but um, it, it was Dick James music and that was that and, and John and Paul profited from every sale of sheet music and every uh, sale of a record that embodied their song and every um, airplay on radio and television every time anybody else played it because there were still orchestras and singers in ballrooms all over the country people still tended to dance in those days to live music rather than to record records so there a lot of income came from public performance of the songs through the PRS PRS was of course a, a key part of any arrangement and a very good employer I would say having worked for them for 10 right. years okay <laughs> right <laughs> performing rights society I mean the Beatles ended up being members of the performing rights society and they got their money from the musical copyright protection society the MCPS this is all just Britain yeah. and of course it goes over to America and they're signed through BMI and BMI is the alternative to ASCAP that yeah. had more of the the black music, the the, the, the support white people's music, yeah. rather than the respectable middle class popular and serious music that yeah. ASCAP had in their repertoire. It, it, it's salutary to, to consider that at this time when the Beatles first break through, the business is still very much of the opinion, the whole music business, and, and not just that, but also broadcasting and musicians as well, that this new music, this this bash them out, electric guitar, plug in an amplifier, three guitars and drums, that's all a noise, that's not real music. <clears throat> real music is proper music, mm. you know, proper light classics or classics or, or properly considered songs, operas and so on. If you look up a book about music in the 1960s, it will purely be about classical and opera. It won't be about jazz, it won't be about anything that came out of Tim Pan Alley. All that was considered inferior or, or, or indeed trash. And but, the Beatles were at the trashy end of the business, undoubtedly. And I'm just wondering if it's related then to the amount of money that it started to make, clearly, that they might have also been behind. What changed that quite dramatically, you know? That yeah. suddenly this isn't just, you know, a, a couple of boys with a, a few guitars. It's, it's you know, it, it, it becomes the kind of Beatlemania that takes over the, yeah. the whole world eventually. Um, well, it does. It does, but it never changed the... It, 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 it didn't change the opinion of everyone who, who still held the view that it was rubbish mm. <clears throat> and noise and that that did maintain in the Beatles case it changed principally well for, for multiple reasons but principally because the songs of Lennon and McCartney it was quickly realized le lent themselves to other treatments and it was through the recording of their songs by more established artists that older people tended to go you know what that's quite a good song right as opposed to the Beatles, you know, guitars and drums version, there's actually a good song underneath all of that. Mm. Uh, so that that was a big part of the of them attaining respectability outside of the sphere that they operated in. And as you uh, you mentioned the, um, the, the that shift in the industry from sort of Tim Pan Alley songwriters producing things, artists and repertoire, yeah. uh, people finding the repertoire and the artists, but they still saw themselves. A bit in that old mode, in, in, in again going back to the m interview you did with Paul mm. about they would be writing for other people. They wanted to be 
a yeah. songwriting team and they thought well when all the fuss dies down and people won't buy our records anymore at least we've got the songwriting thing that we can yeah fall back on yes exactly because i mean rock and roll had only been around a few years it was it was the bubble that was going to burst it was expected mm. to last five minutes it was still going after five years but mm. surely not forever and um I go back to that meeting at Brian Epstein's place in Faulkner Street in Liverpool, which is really quite a, a, a very, well, it's a very important meeting, not in the moment, but as it would come to be seen, because John and Paul decided there and then that any surplus songs they had, they could actually, Brian Epstein could find a home for them. Mm -hmm. And Dick James became a key part of that of that uh, avenue of revenue as avenue of revenue it's quite good that. It's good. <laughs> I should write that down um, but it, be, be because Brian Epstein took on other acts that he was managing he didn't just manage the Beatles and they were looking for songs they weren't songwriters necessarily and they were looking for songs and John and Paul were writing quite freely by this point mm. and they they knew that oh, we, we'll do this one but we, we probably won't do that one because they might have considered it substandard or it was simply surplus at that point oh simply surplus I'll write that down as well <laughs> I'm on fire <laughs> and um, so uh, at this point Brian Epstein takes on a new contract with John and Paul there's a contract to manage the Beatles as a group but there's also a contract to manage John Lennon and Paul McCartney as songwriters I did not know the existence of that contract until I found it in a lawyer's file wow and it's one of the major things for me about the early years I put it in tune in but almost no one has noticed it mm. but it is actually very instructive to what follows because from 63, there's a great acceleration in Lennon and McCartney songs. When the Beatles weren't number one, John Lennon and Paul McCartney were quite often number one with some other artists. And the money that flowed in from things like that was just off the scale. I saw a, a video on YouTube that I hadn't seen actually until I was looking th through things. A meeting in 1968 that was recorded with Paul and John with Dick James. Mm. And that was part of a renegotiation as I understand it at that time over the publishing yes yes that's 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 a very interesting meeting another very instructive meeting what you see in the Peter Jackson get back of Dick James's visit to Twickenham when they're out there recording or just sitting around actually that day um, is 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 not doesn't make for entirely comfortable viewing because the relationship has soured by this point uh, and an, an earlier indication of its souring is the 68 meeting that was filmed by, again, by the Beatles with their cameras, um, in which they're quite strong with Dick. It, it's, it's not an easy thing to watch. It, it makes one uncomfortable to see it. There's much more of it than you can see on YouTube. Um, and there's, there's audio of what, of what we haven't got. Right. And uh, it's, it's, it's not very pleasant. They were... They felt aggrieved by Dick, and they may have been, they must have been frustrated that by this point he wasn't listening to them, uh, to the, it wasn't acceding to their wishes, and so they get a bit brusque with him. And then what they did, which was particularly unkind, is they took that bit of film of them being unkind to him and they showed it to, uh, at an American record convention, which, yeah. I, you know, it makes me feel uncomfortable just thinking about it. And, you know, when people ex uh, excoriate Dick James for selling his shares in their music publishing, then this doesn't necessarily excuse that act, but it has to be seen as part of the picture of why he did it. And this was him selling those shares led to the loss of control of the catalogue that then became the case with Sony ATV further down the line yeah they, they'd lost they had never really had control of it I mean it was a 50-50 company in the first instance but the Beatles it was Dick James music having 50% uh, and it was John Lennon Paul McCartney and Brian Epstein having the other 50% that's what Northern Songs was but because this is getting quite complicated but essentially because the, of the extremely high taxation rates in this country in those days the vast revenue streams that were that were were damming up for Lennon and McCartney, they couldn't be released because they just would have given it all to the government in tax. So they had to find ways of realising their income, and one of the ways of doing it was to make Northern Songs take it public on the stock exchange. 
unheard of thing for popular music songs, a pop group, to have their songs on the stock exchange. You can go and buy shares in their songs. And it was laughed at derisively by the stock exchange fraternity. But, uh, and after initially the song, it didn't appear to be a very successful flotation, but then it started to rise and rise and rise. Mm. Uh, because those, it was recognised that these songs are very valuable copyrights. But from the moment it went public, there were five million shares, and anyone could buy shares in them, and plenty of people did. And John and Paul's uh, combined shareholding was, and I should remember this, but it's all in my notes. It was significant, but it wasn't mm. control. I mean, shares were owned by everybody. Mm. Dick James also didn't own controlling share nobody owned a controlling share in it anymore but when eventually he sold his stock it was bought by Lou Grade who then had whatever he already had from the open market plus Dick James's and Dick James's business partner Charles Silver and then set out to try and acquire 51% so Paul McCartney now says in his lyrics book in fact I'm going to read it to you right here okay um, this is a book that came out in late 2021, page 847. Um, Dick James sold our publishing in Northern Songs without giving us a chance to buy the company. Um, that is not wrong, but it's really not right either. So was it in some ways an innovation in terms of how, as you were saying, oh, yeah. it was un unheard of that pop songs would be floated yeah. on, the, on the market. Yeah. Um, and even though... It, it sometimes is quite um, upsetting to read through the sort of rancorous, all the, all the arguments and the rows of what happened afterwards, because what we want to remember about the Beatles is the joy that they gave yeah. us and that obviously they shared within each other. But it was an innovation, yes. what had happened around the business. It, it was. It, 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 the city, the collective jaw dropped in the city when it was announced that they were going to try and float John Lennon and Paul McCartney's songwriting songs written but also songs to get to come until 1973 I mean in the Get Back film such is the broken relationship between Dick James and Paul McCartney as we see it and with John Lennon as well that Dick says and we've got John Lennon and Paul McCartney in Northern Songs and Paul says something like yeah for the moment I, mm. I forget the exact words it's something he, he throws in a little remark there that is he's he's, he's is intended to spike Dick James, mm. and Dick unfortunately rises to the bait. What do you mean? Well, you know, I mean it was a, an inflammatory thing for Paul to say because he had a contract with Northern Songs for another four years till February '73. So that his songs were going to be invest, invested in Northern, whether he liked it or not. But he said it to to rile Dick, and Dick took the bait, um, and that is an indication of a relationship that's in mm. trouble. But clearly, at that time, what you get from the Get Back documentary as well is just how in in shock they were at Brian Epstein's death. That, that all of these things were happening, the background to yeah. se severe bereavement and young people who in this pressured environment who were doing something that was equivalent to kind of going to space in terms of yeah. what they were what they were achieving culturally, and they had these. I mean, is there an element of their disagreement with Dick James being, you know, there's no grown-up now in charge, we're having to be the grown-ups, and they're kind of acting out in some way. Well, in Dick's case in particular, with the music publisher, the Beatles had a relationship with Dick, John and Paul particularly had a relationship with Dick through Brian Epstein, the manager. Brian was the middleman. Brian, Dick would go to Brian and say, Brian, I want such and such and such a thing, or, you know, can I do this or should I do that? And Brian would then pass it on to John and Paul. He would drop in at sessions. They would see him from time to time. He would come and he would go. They would be happy to see him and happy for him to leave. But there wasn't much of a direct relationship. And with Brian Epstein's death, there was no buffer between the two parties. And because there was resentment growing on the part of John and Paul in particular, and because Dick probably didn't like the things they were saying to him, their meetings became tense and tetchy as opposed to Brian being there to just kind of make it all okay. Mm -hmm. So it exposed like two parts, two metal parts coming together without a rubber between yeah, them, yeah. you know? Yeah. And they just started to have friction and it was, um, 
and that's what you see. And I'm very glad to see it's, it's uncomfortable viewing, but I'm glad to see it because it's so instructive. We see what their relationship was from that bit of the film. So yeah, good to have it, but but not easy viewing. So arguably, I think unarguably actually, had the taxation rates in this country not been so astonishingly high in the 1960s, Northern songs would not have been floated. And, and, and John and Paul would not have, they would have always owned 50% and mm. therefore Dick James couldn't have done anything, couldn't have passed it on to anybody. Mm. He could have passed over his part of it perhaps, but it would have had to have been by agreement with the other side anyway, I think. Mm. So it was the very fact that it was public and that people could buy shares in it that, that made it prey to take over and that's eventually what happened. It's, so it's far too simplistic for Paul to say this man sold our songs. He's not wrong and I know why he's saying it but I mean he also knows that there's a much bigger more complex story behind that than he's saying. Another thing we wanted to ask about as well was Beatles songs I, I, you, in spite of all the danger, you've corrected me. You're absolutely right, of course. <laughs> I haven't expected anything else. Smart. Um, that Paul also references the fact that he probably ripped that off an Elvis song. I yeah. seem to remember that. And he says he won't tell you which one it is because he doesn't want to get in trouble. Yeah. And then there was the Come Together and the Chuck Berry case. So, um, I mean, have you been looking at any of those accusations of copyright infringement that came out from the Beatles or vice versa, the other way around, where people had written songs that the Beatles said, hang on, you're just nicking that off us. Yeah, well, as, as to their absolute credit, the Beatles always said, John and Paul, particularly as songwriters, that we've nicked this bit from there and we've nicked that bit from here and so <laughs> on, because that's what creative people do. You be inspired by something you hear, some other songwriter's written a great piece of music and you think, oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. love the bass line on that or I love the harmonies on that or I love the drum pattern on that and you work it into something you're doing and, and that is what creativity is all about. You don't, you can't just always create from a blank slate. We're all of us influenced by the things that we read, the things that we see and hear. But what you can do is you can synthesize it with your own talent and turn it out into something that is original, even though the drum pattern is inspired by that Otis Redding track or the bass line is inspired by that Chuck Berry bass line. Chuck didn't play it, but on a Chuck Berry song, and um, and so and the Beatles, to their credit, always said, you know, we're knickers, basically. <laughs> uh, and in the case of I saw us standing there, there's a bass line which is um, another Chuck Berry song they used to do, talking about you, and they said that in interviews. I mean, they were they were guileless. It was wonderful <laughs> how open they were. Um, but once or twice, this 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 magpie tendency would come back and bite them because of course the Beatles were so successful that people knew that if they could just get a small purchase into something they could, there's money to be made here so John Lennon using some lines from Chuck Berry's You Can't Catch Me in his song Come Together on the Beatles album Abbey Road is not much really there's really not much to it but, but he got done for it yeah. uh, and, and lost and George Harrison subconsciously using some a, a run of notes from the chiffons, he's so fine, mm -hmm. in My Sweet Lord, um, ended up, we, well, it ended up in a very complicated and very interesting case, but it, initially, at least, uh, he, he lost that case. Um, and, and, and it aggrieves me that when people talk about My Sweet Lord, it's almost the first thing they say. And, mm -hmm override overwhelming the fact that it's such an extraordinary piece of work it's just such a brilliant song and such a brilliant recording and the fact that this thing happened to it is it should be on the side somewhere it shouldn't be in the middle of what we talk about but um people do uh, lennon and mccartney were ripped off more than any composers out there but they never went after anybody mm. um, until eventually the ruttles happened in 1977, 78, but that wasn't Lennon and McCartney going after them. That was ATV Music, who owned the Northern Songs catalog right, by then, okay. who just decided that this was uncomfortable. This was uncomfortably close to our our copyrights, and that we should have a share in it. So, what was the outcome of that? Because they, uh, 
George was quite heavily involved in the Ruttles project and with Monty Python and Eric Idle and Neil. Yes, Lewis. well, again, you know, we come back to copyright. This the Ruttles is 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 numerous copyrights, isn't it? There's the copyright in the creation of the film All You Need Is Cash, which yeah. was you know in the, in the writing of it, which was Eric Idle's copyright. Yeah. There was probably NBC's copyright in that they financed it and and therefore had a stake in mm-hmm. in its in its um, overall copyright. Um, but then there's the musical songs that are within it, which were composed by Neil Innes, who was a great parodist and loved the Beatles. And these songs came naturally out of his love for the Beatles. And they're great songs. And I mean, I love them. I love listening to, just to the songs. They're great songs. And they're not all, obviously, from a particular song, but some of them are. Yeah. Piggy in the Middle is I Am The Walrus. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. ATV argued that without I Am The Walrus existing, then, I am, then Piggy in the Middle wouldn't exist. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of unarguable because it's it's quite clear that A has led to B mm. and in the end Neil had to surrender I believe I'm not privy to the detail but I think it was 50% of the copyright not all of it wow. but 50% of the copyright when I was lucky enough to meet him he, he came in when I was working at PRS came in to see me I got him to sign my uh a uh, copy of like, Shangri-La was the, the oh. sort of re-release anthology yes. um, pastiche thing and so I got him to sign that he was he wasn't that happy at the time though because he was looking to get his royalties out of his publisher which is why he came to see me right. but it was uh, yeah that was a sort of fanboy moment but he was yeah. he was, uh, and, and he himself then went and sued uh, Oasis yes. for the how yes. sweet to be an idiot yes um, whatever what was the song I can't remember was um, it do 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 yeah that one um, yes I free to be whatever I yes Yes, that yeah, yeah that, that Oasis track, yeah, yeah. which we're going to remember when we finish. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, How Sweet to Be an Idiot. So he ended up with the 50% or some share anyway in that Oasis song that he really didn't have anything to do with, but on the other hand, lost 50% of songs that he had written, which must have been very painful. <laughs> to, to go back then to the 60s, uh, in the day, John Lennon and Paul McCartney decided... <laughs> didn't have to sit down and have a meeting about it, but they just decided that they didn't want their songs to be heavily pastiched. Uh, and there were quite a lot of pastiche. There always had been pastiche uh, songs in the music business and uh, or answer songs, um, which were basically taking the theme of the original work and, and doing something, a twist on it in some way. Like 60 Minute Man was in the 50s and there were yeah. loads of songs that yes, came up. Yes, exactly that. Exactly. And the business had always been worked that way and they agreed that they didn't, they would, they asked Dick James to, to prevent anyone doing it. So when Dick received, as he often did, requests to parody a Beatles song and that they would have to be asked that, the question, the copyright holder would have to be asked, mm. they always said no. Mm. So the Baron Knights, for example, had hits with uh, um, pastiches in those days, medley pastiches mm. of other pop songs that were current. No Lennon, no Beatles songs. I think "I Wanna Be Your Man" was done pastiching the Stones recording, and I think "Love Me Do" may have been done. But no, all the requests for a pastiche of "A Hard Day's Night" or a pastiche of any mainstream Lennon McCartney song were always denied because. It was annoying. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, there might be some money to be made, but I mean, the government, the tax man was only going to take it anyway. So <clears throat> they, 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 they kept their powder dry. Um, it, it may seem relatively well organised, but it could be so much better organised. Yeah. I just don't have the time to. In fact, divide myself into several parts. One part of me would be filing and organising, while the other part is getting on with the real work. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But instead, I just get on with the real work because it's so pressing. Yeah. Uh, and this place, though organised to a point, is nowhere near as organised as I'd like it to be. You need a librarian or an archivist, don't you? It, yes, yes, I, I really do. It, it would be of immense benefit to, yeah. me to have to have that. So on the floor above this is that's where my desk is, and that's where I work, uh, and that has a uh, multiple more aisles of books. Shall we look? Can we look? Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. That's the spiral staircase. Okay, here we go. So, is this where you spend most of your time? Do you have a sort of 
nine to five regime or is it, uh, it draw it, you in much more than that? No, I tend to work from the moment I get up to the moment I go to bed okay. with, with some time off for good behaviour. But <laughs> um, So, uh, yeah, six something to whatever amazing. fairly late is. What a beautiful yeah. space to work in yeah. as well. Yeah. Just like, I don't know, the, the yeah. kind of, the whole atmosphere in here. Mm. So is, we've got books and we've got things that look like manuscripts and... Yeah. And uh, sort of these stuff. are all the music papers, British music papers from 1960 to 73. I also have others downstairs from 48 to 92. So NME and... Melody Maker and Record Mirror, okay. Disc, Sounds, yeah. and some of the trades as well, Record Retailer, Music Week and so on. Are, are they complete the records stage. of all of them? Or just these the are, these, these boxes that you see here, they, they are complete and um, they're a master, even though so were you buying a lot of those? them have now been read. Were you buying them? Actually I was buying some of them at the time, but also not keeping them. Okay. I tend to be a keeper of things, but I wasn't as a child. I wasn't keeping those as a young person, um, but I've acquired them right. as, as a library, um, rather like I have a set of Radio Times, uh, which goes back to the beginning actually, which is now ninety nine years of Radio Times, and I, I buy those right to to maintain the collection. Right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And these various aisles here, these are all books on the Beatles. Yeah. So there, there, there would you say you've got every now. single book? I used to, I used to be able to say that, um, but it, it's gone a bit bananas in the last two, three years with with self publishing. Yeah, okay. And um, I see a lot of books now on Amazon and other book websites. So I just think, ah, but shouldn't there be a sort of legal deposit where anyone writes a Beatles book, it should come to you? <laughs> shouldn't we get that encoded in legislation? <laughs> What's well, a very nice thought? As it as it is, I buy them because. Uh, I don't have any right to be sent anything for nothing. Oh, well, so um, so I buy them. So. But it is like a national collection, essentially. It is. A, it's an important collection. Mm. Mm. And in fact, I was I very rarely go on Twitter, but I was on it last night, and someone had asked the question of the Twitter public: "What Beatle book are you reading at the moment?" Mm. And I just scrolled quickly down through the responses, mm. and it was amazing what a disparate variety of of books, most of them very good, mm. well, not all, but most mm. of them, uh, are being read by people. Mm. And it, it kind of, even though I live amongst these books all the time, it was interesting to be reminded of just how many the variety. there are, the variety mm. of them, particularly. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Well, I am. I'm reading Tune In at the moment. You know, I was doing obviously part of the research, but also after seeing you in the literary festival, thinking, actually, I'm really, this is fantastic. This is amazing. I'm ready to go deep Beatle again after having for a few years thinking I don't want to yeah. overdo it. And now it's like, no, I, I, it's it's absolutely fantastic. Yes, it's, it's never less than rewarding to go deep Beatle. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I live that way, and uh, mm -hmm. it's never. I never get bored of it. No. 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 no, well, that's what doing research is all about, I think, yeah. isn't it? Getting lost in it. Yes, yes. I, I, I wouldn't want to be researching something that bored me, and not if you go as deep as this. But mm. being that it is endlessly, and I do mean endlessly, interesting, mm. um, there's no chance of boredom. No, no, no. All that lot though, that's archive boxes, okay. which if I had more filing cabinets would go in. That's all my work. This, so what, that's all my projects of the last so when that says 40 years or so. anthology, that's the work you were doing with yeah. Apple on the anthology. Yeah, there's about four archive boxes in there, which is the entire, in, in that stack, uh, which is the history of the Beatles anthology as I experienced it. It's all the faxes and letters and file notes and proofs and, you know, when you're deeply involved in a project, you, there's a lot of paperwork yeah. and that's I keep incredible. it all. I keep it all. So, yes, and all, all, all the work I've done is, is there. But actually, these days I have more on my computer than, than you see in physical material now, in physical form. I used to think that I would print everything out on my computer uh, in order to file it properly, and now I'm thinking I should be scanning all my paper stuff and just keeping it on the computer. So you've got quite an immense digital archive as well. Vast. Yeah. Vast, yeah. which would which, which probably double everything that you see here. Wow. Yeah. I mean, hundreds of thousands of documents. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah. Is this the full archive, or is there some elsewhere now? This is it. This is it. Yeah. Okay. And like you, thirteen point two tons. Is that right? That's yes. Gosh, <laughs> when I moved out, when I when I relocated from Hertfordshire to here, it was thirteen point two tons. Right. So the removal men told me okay. they they had a way of weighing it before they put it onto their truck. Um, and the survey of the house said it's okay. You can bring this stuff here. The floor is floor is not going to give way. Um, it's it's. Trial and error. I mean, I think it'll be all right. It's now been in, this has been here for nearly two years. It wasn't here immediately that I came here, but it's been here about two years. So I think if it was going to go, it would have gone by now. Yes, yeah. Mm. Have you got that book that's the one that's the really detailed analysis, the recording sessions from a technical point of view, the one that, it's about 800 pounds. Recording 800 pounds. I saw it. We Probably mean it. recording yeah. the Beatles by... Kevin Ryan and Brian Kehue, that'll be this one. one. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's it's, a weighty it's, tone. It's a weighty tone. Do you want to, yeah. you want to feel that how weighty? That in itself probably could do with a reinforced shelf, couldn't it? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so that, that, where have you seen this book uh, before? It was at the Drill Hall Library. The Drill Hall Library oh, where yeah. we have yeah. shared a library with Kent Christchurch in Greenwich. And they yeah. have a Centre for Music and Audio Technology there. And uh -huh. the library said it's worth investing in that. For it is. So people go, oh, that's nice. I'll get that as a you know, coffee table book. And then, of course, <laughs> they find out how much. Yes, well, and also it was limited edition. Um, it, it was self-published by the authors, ooh, about 10 years ago. And it's it's kind of an art book almost in, in, in the way that it does. It's, it's deeply, deeply technical. Everything about, time. yes. It's beautiful. You're absolutely right. Everything about it is beautiful. It is deeply technical, and I'm not a technical person, so that aspect of it kind of goes over my head. But on the other hand, if I have a question, I know where to turn. Yeah. And I also trust the authors. That I don't trust every Beatles book author, far from it, but um, I was able to observe the way they were going about this book and I knew that it was going to be right, mm. it, that it had the right standards of approach. Fantastic. So a beautiful job, uh, not mass market. It's probably not a mass market subject anyway, mm. not, not this element of it, not the microphones and... and as I say, you're interested in it because of your kind of sound recording. Yeah, yeah, because uh, a lot of the artificial double yeah. tracking and the nature of the, you know, the, the valve compressors that they it, were using and all that stuff. If you, it's got some amazing pictures, I can see. Yes. Know, of the technology. The, their own photography is beautiful of wow. the equipment, but also the archive oh, photography wow. research is very good. Um, so in any picture of the Beatles in the studio, they will actually not look so much at the foreground, but at the background and say, well, that equipment there, that is a so-and-so, and that is a so-and-so, and they'll tell you how it ended up being used. And the RS-140, the portable oh, sound. Oh, it's one of, my, one, of, one of my favourite Is it? Sound Never go anywhere without yeah. one. No. Um, you, I, I have looked at it. It's Most actually quite these... hurting my arm. Okay, now, I think you probably out. Let me take it off. things <laughs> yeah. have been recreated as digital plugins for using the digital things, and you can buy them all, the one that makes it sound like your digital recording is actually going through mm. the... The, the tape machine at, at Abbey Road, um, right. and like a plug-in that simulates yeah. the sound of George Martin's hand touching a control or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's flattering, but, but also very strange that. Yeah. Because the Beatles themselves, one of the, the key thing about the Beatles was that if there was a rule, they tried to subvert it. And if there was something new, they would try it. What happened right at the end and the yeah. use of the synthesizers. Yes. And, all the way through, in fact. But whatever, what they always tested the thing to its to its limit. They didn't just. One of the advantages of what they did was that they were they found things out by experimentation. Whereas it may possibly, I don't know, may be harder to find things out now because it's all possible uh, to anybody. I, I, again, I'm talking a bit blind because it's not quite my world. But generally speaking, when you're discovering things, you're you're treading fresh turf mm. and when you've got the ability just to flick a switch then you're not necessarily going to discover yeah. something that hasn't been discovered before and maybe that area for the next progression actually isn't recorded music mm. maybe recorded music popular music as we mm. see has matured as an art form and then has become like concert music sort yeah. of unable to innovate in a way that captures the mass yes. mass imagination and it's it's something else now that's yes. happening that's the next Beatles. yes it's not going to be a pop route yes i think you're probably right but that doesn't, um, obviously mankind is creative and uh, especially musically. I mean, there are so many brilliant musicians out there that you can hear them in any pub now. Uh, people are so accomplished. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, there's the ability now to study this stuff properly. 
Um, whereas in the Beatles days, it was just more a hobby. It was an enthusiasm yeah. mm. that carried them forward rather than studied knowledge. Of course. Mm. Mm. Right, back down the spiral stairs. Yeah. This really is an incredible space, though. It's just amazing. I mean, yeah. it's difficult to imagine it as anything other than an archive. Now, I've seen it like this. It's yes, I mean, these these um, really lends itself. The shelving is, is is very well installed. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, I don't know whether it's even movable anywhere else. So what have you got in those boxes there? Uh, let's have a look. Um, so the bottom box on the floor there is box 35 that's got the BBC staff newspaper Ariel right. from 1958 to 69 yeah. and then it's got various loose issues of things like Downbeat and Hit Parade Newsweek, Time, Vogue Cinema Today blah 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 this box here that's full of Private Eye and New Yorker from the 1960s. Mm. This one is, um, those are microfilms of microfiche and I don't even have a reader anymore. Mm. And they are also John Cura's telesnaps. John Cura was a very interesting man who set up business just after the war when television recommenced in 1946. He devised a camera that was trained on the small screen the television and because television then was entirely live and no one had the means of seeing afterwards what it had looked like he took what he called tele snaps okay and would then sell them sometimes to the public but mostly back to broadcasting organizations bbc exclusively at that point 46 i have no idea about this yeah and his photographs they're scattered now there's no single collection but i wrote an article about him yeah because I was so interested in the fact that he had preserved the images of what our TV used to look That's like. That's fascinating. That's incredible. Uh, and in the process of writing that article, I gathered from loads of different sources, a great many telesnaps. I advertised for them and kind of pre-internet almost, yes. but I got a lot of them. So are they standalone images or are they videos? They're, sti they're stills. They're stills. They're stills okay. in which you can see the television. Yeah. You can okay. see that you can see the, the the shape of the screen with the rounded edges, the okay. rounded corners, I should say. Um, but he recorded, you know, he took pictures of a lot of broadcasts that don't exist in any other format. There wow. might be scripts and things like that, but he's got the images of them. And he sold them back to the broadcasters themselves. He would sell them to producers and to actors and actresses and and directors and writers and anyone who had been involved in the making of the program, who might want to have a record of what it looked like. And presumably, with my copyright hat on, nobody at the time would say, hang on, that's our programme, you're selling us back something that we already yeah. own, yeah. and uh, you know, to, to have some kind of issue with it. Presumably, there was because there was no other way of recording it, people just accepted he'd done that, and that he had a valid business model. You've got it exactly right. If you go to the BBC's written archives, mm -hmm. which is in Caversham in Berkshire, which is, in, for my money... I think the most important archive in Britain, yeah. certainly for anything that I ever do, yeah. uh, but I would argue for anything that anybody ever does. Um, then there are correspondence files about John Cura's activities in which questions just like that are asked. How dare this man <laughs> take our copyrighted material, photograph it without our permission, yeah. uh, and then make money from it. But, oh, by the way, P.S., can we please buy some? <laughs> and thank you for doing it. Well, that's always yeah. the way, isn't it? It's, yeah. the, it's the here's the kind of theoretical legal position, and then here's the pragmatic, right? We want that. Yeah. We want to do this thing, and so we accept yeah. that somebody's doing something that arguably is not yeah. above board. Yes, it, he did something that they hadn't actually considered viable or, or, even, or even considered at all. So therefore, they were taken aback by it, but they could see the benefit of, of having it. So I wrote an article about him. So that box there has quite a lot of John Cura's telesnaps in. That's wow. a fascinating box. Yeah. Box 37. Mm. Yeah, and box 38. This has microfilms and microfiche and a whole load of TV scripts. There's a script for that was the week that was right oh on top God. there. Okay. An original script. Original 
Right. Yes, I've got quite a few original TV scripts. That's a, a camera sh a camera script. Okay. For that was the week, which was a live show on a Saturday night. So the the, the content of the sketches is in there as well. So how, how did you acquire something like that then? Um, script. How exactly did I get that one? It might. I mean. That's a good question. I'm not actually sure. It might have come, possibly came from the collection of a man called Dave Freeman, who was a scriptwriter. Didn't work on TW3, but was a scriptwriter in television at that time and had quite a lot of scripts. Right. And I befriended John, I befriended Dave rather, Dave Freeman, when uh, I was writing my biography of Benny Hill because he was Benny Hill's co-writer. And when he died, um, I picked up I was given a lot of what David had. So right. that might be one of his, or it might be from some other source entirely. No, actually, that one is from a BBC radio producer I befriended who left me a lot of stuff in his will. Oh, wow. Mm, that's where that comes from. It's an amazing way of mm. getting research collections, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I spend a lot of time, less so these days, but I have done for consistently for decades, spend a lot of time going to see people who were involved in the act of creating something. Mm. And I, many a time, most times I will say, what's happening, and if they've got things, mm. if they've retained things from their collection, from their career, what's your plan for this when you're gone? You can't be afraid to bring the subject up because we're all gonna die, so let's, mm. you know, let's, let's face that one. And say, what's, where's that gonna go when you die? That pile of papers there. And quite often people will say to me, Oh, I, d I don't know. I don't know. My children will probably throw it away. So it's not interest of no interest to them. And I always say, well, you've got to make a plan for it. You absolutely have to make a plan for that. Otherwise, it will be thrown away. And it's a value. It's not only a value for the fact that you did something very interesting and it's history of television or radio or whatever it might be. But also it's a value to students and historians in the future who will want to access it. Absolutely. And if it's thrown away, that's that. So I, and as a consequence, several people have said to me, I'll leave it all to you. And I'm going, well, that isn't what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't an actually- important thing, yeah. raise the point. Yeah. Now over to you. Yes, you yeah. Take responsibility. Well, they, they, they say, you know, well, you know, since you've brought it up, it's yours. And it's, well, I'm not actually saying that, but I mean, I, if you leave it to me, I will look after it. Yeah. But that isn't really what the point is. The point is you must find a way of looking after and it. And I can see why you're, kind of legacy then is kind of it's almost like you know it, it's just got more and more immense if you've collected yeah. stuff from other people it's yeah. not just the responsibility of now what you've collected yeah it's it's all those other people's that's right and because I will be leaving my archive to a place of study I have been saying to people in recent years if you leave it to me it will still be it will be with it will be kept forever mm. and it will be it might even have your name on it it could be you know the um the Peter Pilbeam collection. Peter Pilbeam collection within yeah. a greater collection. Mm -hmm. Peter Pilbeam was a BBC radio producer based in Manchester. Still alive, um, quite old now, um, but still alive, I'm glad to say. Uh, he produced um, pop music radio shows aim, uh, out of BBC Manchester for national broadcast. And he therefore he auditioned the Beatles. Uh, and produced their first four appearances on BBC Radio back in 1962. And he kept notebooks. And when I went to interview him, he had his notebooks, and I said that very thing, what are you gonna do with these? And he's ended up giving them to me. So I have, the, I have those, for example. Fantastic, mm. yeah. So if, if, if I can change the subject a little yeah. bit, and just be conscious of the time as well, but uh, you, you as a researcher, how, how did you kind of, you know, come to be a researcher in this way? I mean, we, we heard a little bit about your story of working for the music magazine when you were a teenager, but, you know, you, you, you go so deep, you are effectively like, you know, I think Chris said, a, a professor, an academic, mm -hmm. you know, how, you know, is, is that just through curiosity? Is it, is it your absolute fascination with the subject? Um, yes, it's, it's both, it, the last two things you said are both relevant, it is curiosity, and it's a curiosity that is unending because of my, because my interest in the subject is unending. Mm. Um, I find it, I find the Beatles are 
absolutely the stuff of life. I mean, a truly um, bring us of great joy mm. uh, to life. And, and, and I'm not alone in thinking that, obviously. I mean, people have been thinking that now for 60 years and it runs deep in the population, in the world population. Uh, and quite genuinely so, because it is the best of art, as, I'm con as far as I'm concerned. And my own thing is, is quite simply that um, I like information and I like discovery and I have an ability to find things and it, it, it's perfect for this unending desire to learn as much as I possibly can about the world that this all happened in, who these people were and how they did it and um, all the processes. So you end up knowing a whole lot more than you just know about the Beatles um, because as I always say, they didn't exist in a vacuum. So my knowledge is broad as well as deep. Mm. And um, it, it's, it's just something that is, is part of who I am. Mm. I was born with an ability to research. Yeah, uh, so you don't think you were taught it in some way? You think it's something you just... I certainly wasn't parent. taught it. No, yes, no. I, it's, it's actually in my genes. Yeah. I mean, as, a, as a small child, I would go to public libraries and I would bristle if the librarian said to me, the children's section's over there. Because <laughs> I would go straight to the reference section to directories and encyclopedias and um, all sorts of almanacs and so on. And I would look things up and I would make notes about what, uh, probably about cricket scores or football scores or the company that my dad worked for. I, I memorised information from phone books. So I was just that kind of a child. Yeah. And you, you can't be shown that. You just go there of your own volition. Yeah. And so look, researching the Beatles, researching anything is second nature to me, but researching the Beatles is first nature because it goes hand in hand with the love that I have for them that was instilled in me as an infant. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm also, I'm really interested in the way you use documentary sources and then the way you use people and interviews with people. And mm. maybe you could say a little bit about the, the, the different approaches and, you know, but the complementary um, yeah. use of those two different sources. Yeah, I, um, I have trouble with material of the secondary source and these days even third source third length arm length down from original action uh, I try to go to original sources wherever possible and even then you've got to be terribly careful the Beatles is a subject that anyone who's had any association with it um, will have told their story about it so many times mm. because people are always asking them mm. didn't you have something to do with the Beatles mm. or they're mentioning it because it's a boast and, uh, and through that constant retelling comes in a, uh, a, a gradual accumulation of things that didn't really happen, but it, it becomes part of what they remember somehow or other. We all know that one. We all know that the stories told and told and told and told pick up things that never really happened in the first place. Yeah. And so even when I interview people who were witnesses to events, I'm sceptical about what they tell me unless I... Unless I unless it feels right in the first instance, mm. um, based on everything I know, but also based on actual proof. Right. So um, with the, the, the three volume history I'm writing, I have vast amount of documented research, which is for me the, the true truth, the, the absolute kernel of the truth. Um, but then there's the color that comes from people who were present at events telling you what occurred. But if they don't actually naturally mesh together, I won't trust the anecdote mm. as much as I would like to. And I do constantly read books where the authors don't have that high value of um, application about is this story right or not? Mm. It's a good story, put it in, mm. you know. As you were talking earlier when we were yeah, upstairs. Yeah, and I, and I yeah. read other people's books and I read interviews with people and I go, oh, for God's sake, oh, for God's sake, <laughs> oh, for God's sake. And sometimes the word isn't God, yeah. you know. Um, it's something stronger because it's just like, I can't bear it to read inaccuracies. And I'm fighting a losing battle with this three volume history in that I'm trying to get the story right while it's so wrong, it's becoming ever more wrong. The mm. internet has just mm. fanned the flames on how wrong it is. Mm. And everybody's got their point of view and a lot of those are wrong and I despair of all that. And now while I'm writing 
this history of the Beatles. Paul and Ringo are the last two Beatles still alive mm. and they're getting it wrong and people are believing what they're saying and I'm thinking, oh no, don't say that. <laughs> that isn't how it happened. You know that's not how it happened. Mm. Uh, and yet you're really embedding it into the history because it's you saying it, mm. you know. So of course it's going to be trusted. Um, but in reality, you know, not everyone 80 and 80 years and up remembers exactly what happened. No, you know, no. that's just a fact of life. Mm, mm, mm. So um, I, I do feel like I'm losing the battle, but I will leave behind me, um, if I get complete the trilogy before I go, uh, th what, as the far as I can tell, really did happen. Mm. And for those who read it, they will get the sense of it. And for those who just look at what's in the, on the internet, mm. they won't. Mm, mm. I mean, I think this this archive you know that we're in it's just it is just an incredible resource yeah. you you talked um in when we saw you at the literary festival um last month we you said something about potentially wanting to make that archive available in digital format as well but i wondered do you think that would help because we could expose the source material then you know i don't know do you have thoughts of things like people putting um, material up onto Wikipedia does it then level the playing field so that it's all out there or? yeah I can't help but feel that um, for those who bother to look below the surface because on the internet very few people do I mean yeah. who, who goes who goes to page three of Google yeah. results mm. you know unfortunately that's the way it is and I count myself in that as well um, the more I make available um, or the more is made available, whether it's in my lifetime or afterwards, then the greater the possibility of people getting it right mm. um, and learning from what really did happen, get, getting the true sense of everyone's personalities and the, the integration of events, which are too often looked at in isolation, mm. um, is very important. The more that is available, the, the greater chance we all stand of it being interpreted correctly, but it still won't be. Mm. But certainly the chance of it will improve. And I, I would like to see, my intention is that to leave this collection of Beatles knowledge, uh, information, um, to a place of study. Mm. Um, because it, it needs to be available for students, for other authors, for anybody who's interested. Absolutely. And it isn't just about the Beatles because in the art of, in the act of collecting knowledge on the Beatles, I collect so much more yeah. to the left and to the right and in front and behind it. Um, and But eventually, I think, um, for those who can't physically get to the library where it's situated, I think it, it, it ultimately all up, available for everybody. Mm. Mm. And the, the, the writers of these letters and the, the directors of the companies and all that, they're all going to be gone. Mm. You know, in the Beatles story now, most of the participants are gone. Mm. I mean, that is the reality of it. Events are now 60 plus years ago. Yeah. But might we find ourselves in a tricky period where the main protagonists are gone? So Neil Aspinall, Derek Taylor, they can't make a decision themselves. It's now you have Apple and you've described you have the Apple board that have certain control over certain elements of the Beatle empire. Mm. Um, and in our world, in archives and libraries, we're trying to make collections available online all the time. And copyright, copyright is a big is barrier a to that yeah. because the stuff, particularly 20th century, there's a big hole in 20th century research because libraries tend to be quite risk averse and cautious. They don't want to put things up there unless yeah. they're clear they've got the copyright holder's permission. But that is an incredibly complicated and, and, and uh, time consuming process that often ends up not knowing who the copyright holder is and we have these orphan works. So presumably I'm looking around your archive and thinking, I'd imagine there's an awful lot here that if an archivist was trying to put it online, a librarian, they'd have to spend a lot of time. Do you yeah. foresee an issue actually with control by Apple or other, because you know, this is such a commercially valuable area, isn't it? It is, it is. And, and uh, the Beatles Apple company um, do still con do control a lot of rights mm -hmm. and, and they control what people can do. And, and that's, a, that's an understandable control as well. The fraction, the, what we see in the world in terms of activities around the Beatles are about a fraction of the things that could be if they allowed everything to occur, but they do. And they always have, right from Brian Epstein's day onwards, clamped down as much as possible. 
Brian Epstein as a manager of the Beatles was was quite brilliant in not overexposing them and in not uh, not making them prey to over commercialization. It was very far sighted uh, policy at the time, which they were completely comfortable with. Um, but there will come a time when everybody's gone, and I don't know. I mean, you tell me what is the copyright in a piece of paper? If 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 I've got a letter that was written in 1963 and the person who wrote it has died and the person who received it has died and the company is no longer in business, mm. is there copyright in, in that? The copyright for 70 years after the death of the author. Mm. So even for something that's an archival thing that was created at that point in time, it actually will remain in copyright. If it's unpublished, it will be in copyright until at least December the 31st, 2039, or 70 years after the death of the author, depending on which one comes later. So. You, that's where libraries find themselves in this very difficult position, and that's why they employ people like us to, to work through <laughs> yeah. those issues. But if that individual was employed by a company, wouldn't the, comp the copyright rest in the vest on the company? Probably, probably, probably yeah. in the company, but still the duration is calculated on the death date of the author. So it, well, it, okay. it, it, it's it's uh, that that's the way. That, and copyright law has expanded over the years, and that that's one of the issues that we. In, in, in the library and education research world, we're constantly saying to government, actually shorter copyright terms help all these other things. You know, you might say yeah. this is how people people make a living, but actually, do you really need for there to be this protection long, long after the the, the person has actually yeah. died? Yeah. I, I'm not familiar with all, I mean, this is much more your specialist yes, subject than mine, yeah, yeah. and as you're <laughs> describing, it's, it's clearly complex, I mean, yeah. very much complex. Um, it won't be my issue to worry about. No. Um, I would like to make it all publicly available, but it, obviously the library or university that takes this will have to consider their own risk when they when they're putting things yeah. up. And that is what it will be. It will yeah. be about a risk mm. managed sort of decision. Uh, yeah. There are great quantities of documents already on the internet that probably aren't clear. But then again, mm. there's a great deal of copyright violation on the internet. Full well, stop. Exactly. Including my own work is being yeah. violated, and and I have to witness my own violations of my own intellectual property being violated. But don't we all? Mm. Don't we all these days? I mean, it's just one of those things. And as a user of the internet, I naturally find myself violating other people's copyrights because I need to know something and there it is. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, I'm not doing it to, um, to make a million out no. of. I'm doing it to no. write into a history. Yes. Um, I mean, arguably, you could use the defence of uh, pri research private study, which is Section 29 of the Copyright Designs and Patents Act. That, that says non-commercial yeah. research. So is your yes. research commercial ultimately... You're writing a book yeah. that is in order to make a living, but are you doing it primarily for commercial purposes? It's yeah. a question that we, in our world, we ask all the time, and there's Absolutely. no answer to it. You all go round right. and round and circles. Yeah, I spend a lot of time in libraries and archives, as you can imagine, mm. and um, for the last 20 years or so, one, one always has to fill out some kind of disclaimer on arrival mm. when you start to use the, the facility, and you've gone all that way to look at whatever it is you've you've pre-ordered and you're anticipating an exciting day of discovery of opening document folders and finding some information that you really need to know um, you're not going to sign you're not going to put on that piece of paper something that's going to block you going in mm. you'll say yeah yeah mm. uh, whatever it is I'll sign it mm. And and we've all done that. All researchers have done that. It's just like you're not going to you're not going to deny yourself entry to something. But ultimately, I am doing it for commercial product. In, in that it goes into a book, and the book goes on sale. And that is how you make your living, which is yeah. you know. And but if yeah. you deny researchers and historians and biographers and so on the opportunity to look at pieces of paper and learn from them, then what's the point of a library in the first place? Absolutely. Exactly. No, absolutely. Well, part, that's part of our mission is to try to avoid libraries being so cautious. Absolutely. Because there's such a disparity between libraries as institutions, very cautious, it's all about preservation and making sure... And then you've got entrepreneurs and businesses for many years and they look at copyright, it's, it's weighing up profit and loss, isn't it? Oh, we'll do it, we'll take the risk. And they mm. do it and we're thinking, not that we're suggesting libraries should operate as commercial entities or should suddenly throw caution to the wind but there's got to be a middle ground there when we're actually thinking yes. about how to get the best out of all these and, fantastic and primarily yeah. because you know copyright is there there is balance in the law that's why we have copyright exceptions that mm. let us let libraries do all sorts of things to preserve collections but also let researchers yes. um and and people who want to teach and you know yes. study do things yes. that we believe 
it, you know, it's about people understanding what they can do, not what it kind of locks down yes. and protects so much, because there's just too much emphasis always on that. So There is, yes, on, on the level of being cautious. You yeah. know, best, best not to invite in the possibility of trouble, so we'll just say no. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm writing this trilogy and um, tune in the first volume, the only one out at the moment, 780,000 words in its fullest form. Wow. And it was originally probably, I'm guessing here, but it was originally, let's say, 781,000 words. Uh, and after delivery, it was read, naturally so, it was read by the legal, three legal mm. people actually for the my book publishers, Little Brown which they had to do, and um, most books are read for legal. Mm. And um, the question of, had I cleared the usage of quoting from letters? Okay. Ah, yeah. And the Beatles yeah. were in Hamburg in yeah. 1960, 61, 62, and they would write home to family or to fans. Mm. In the case of fans, the fans kept the letters, and I would meet these fans, and they would show me their letters, and I would write down or take a photograph or whatever of what it said and then I'd want a quote from it because it was germane to my storytelling yeah. and in like it was a George Harrison letter the legal person said have you cleared this with Olivia Harrison George's widow and I went no I haven't mm. will you clear it and I went oh, I don't think I'll get clearance if I ask and mm. besides it'll bog down mm. the process mm. for months Absolutely. potentially potentially um, not necessarily, but potentially, you don't always get a quick reply. So, uh, uh, no, well, you're going to have to cut it. Mm. And that would probably be because under UK law, you're, there is a quotation exception, yes. but it has to be for material that has been made publicly available. Yes. So if it hasn't been That's made publicly right. available, then, then you can't rely on that exception. However, in, in the US, they have fair use, which is much broader, and you might actually, you can, it has been shown that you you are legally justifiable in quoting unpublished or right. unmade available material. But yes. that's where publishers as well can be quite cautious. There's Absolutely. work in our world um, where there's some academics that are challenging that uh, mm -hmm. and, and people that we know um, working on a project, Tanya Rapplin, Emily Hudson, looking at quotation norms in publishing, which is you know a bit pointy-headed at our side of things, but we're quite keen to say, look, do we really have to have this system that, okay, it's there for sort of to promote commercial activity and publishing and to support publishing, but it's stopping us from making these things available. Yeah. Mm. And it's scholarship. Yes. I mean, even yes. though what you're doing is uh, you're producing books that are sold and that are bestsellers, it's still scholarship. And whether it applies to that or to something which is in a university open access repository, we've got to have some common principles. Yes, yeah. yes, I know. Uh, in the, in, I remember one letter in particular. It was a brilliant letter that George Harrison wrote to a girl Beatles fan in Liverpool called Sue, Sue Houghton, who had formed herself into a little little group, kind of just in name only, really, at, at, at that point, called the Cement Mixers Guild. And she was known <laughs> as... The Beatles knew her as Sue Cement Mixer. Very good. Uh, and um, she went around to George's house while he was away in Hamburg and sat with George's parents and George's new first car was in the driveway of Ford Anglia mm. and she had I, I can't remember the exact detail but either she had said to Olivia sorry to um, Louise Harrison George's mother can I wash George's car or it had come up as a suggestion somehow or other George Harrison wrote to her from Hamburg with instructions on how to wash his car and George was very precious about his cars, and it was a new car. Oh, he was a huge petrol head. He was. He? <laughs> he was. Even though this was a Ford Anglia, yeah, yeah. not exactly Formula One, but nonetheless, it was a very precious commodity. Um, and so he sent Sue instructions, and it was typically George. It was funny, it was droll, it was dry, it was witty. And it ended up with his instruction that she go and keep all the dirty water that's come off his car, <laughs> take it over to Paul's house and dump it over Paul's house. <laughs> And I wanted to quote the letter, and Sue still had the letter, and I wanted to quote it. And Sue is a, a, a lovely voice within the book, <clears throat> so it's part of her story as well that she received this letter from George. Um, and I had to cut most of it and paraphrase it. 
Uh, and I, you know, I could paraphrase it, but I couldn't yeah, yeah. quote his words because I exceeded that limit beyond which the the, 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 the legal readers They wanted handed. permission. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't want to go to Olivia Harrison and ask because I didn't expect I would get a yes. Yeah. Yeah. And well, so I just paraphrased it. We'll have to wait for the reprint at the end of the 21st century after 70 years of okay. last. Mm. And the point is, it would have George would have come. I mean, George comes out of that brilliantly anyway. Yeah, but he would have yeah, come yeah. out even more brilliantly. <laughs> we would have all enjoyed George's humour and all enjoyed everything about that yeah. letter. But I had to cut it because it wasn't right. <laughs> but of course, as an author myself, I don't want people to abuse my copy. No. Right? And no. So there is. A, I understand. I'm not blind to the the need for copyright, but I mean, it was a personal just letter. They would just respond to the fans, and it was from him to her it wasn't necessarily public property no so you could argue the other way well that that should remain private unless he decided to, yes. to publish it yeah. yes yeah but equally i think it's yeah it's obviously sad that you couldn't get that in. it is yeah. <laughs> it's a great story yes great it story. is now i know we're wrapping up yeah. but there yes. is some there yeah. is there let me let me extend it just by a couple of minutes because there is something interesting happened in the world of beatles copyright mm. which i think is very newsworthy and somehow not become a news story. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. And I, I, I don't understand why. And we do have a copyright news jingle. <laughs> Shall I get the jingle out? <laughs> jingle, jingle away. <laughs> um, as we've discussed, Lennon and McCartney own their copyrights or half own their copyrights and then part own their copyrights and in the end didn't own their copyrights at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were bought in 1969 by Lou Grade or Lou Grade's ATV Music mm -hmm. which got 51% of the shares in Northern Songs and took it off the market, took it off um, the stock market. So it became a privately owned company again, bought in 1984, was it, by Michael Jackson? Mm -hmm. As Paul very humorously says, part humor, part anger, I think, understandably, um, that Michael Jackson, who was cash rich from making Thriller, and believe me, by the 1980s, artists really could make proper money from their sales of their records, which wasn't the case so much in the 60s. Mm. Um, Thriller was the best-selling album ever, I think, at that time, and therefore Michael Jackson was just awash with money. And Paul said, buy music publishing catalogues. It's a great <laughs> investment, because he had. Yeah. After the Beatles, although he didn't own many of his own songs, he bought others. He, the Buddy Holly catalogue is owned by Paul McCartney, yeah. for example. Um, so, um, and Paul was always, you know, and then Michael Jackson follows Paul's advice, buys publishing catalogues and buys Paul's. <laughs> he buys the Lennon and McCartney songs of yeah. Northern Songs. He bought ATV music, in other yeah. words. Um, and then he got into financial difficulties, 50% of it was owned by Sony, and then I think when Michael Jackson died, Sony got the rest of it. So the Lennon and McCartney songs in, until, which is what I'm coming to, until recently have owned, have been owned by Sony, or mm. Sony, however you say it. But there's been a change, and this hasn't made the news. Uh, the fact that they didn't own them made the news a lot, but the fact that there's been a shift, hasn't really made the news yet, and the shift is indicated by the copyright credits at the back of Paul McCartney's book of lyrics. Ah, okay. Because the, the book quotes a lot of Paul McCartney's song lyrics from through the years, so they need to have credits at the back of the book. I always look at the credits, I've mm. always been fascinated with copyright credits. Similarly, the Get Back project, which was November of 2021, almost the same time as the book, um, that has credits at the end of every episode that they're very interesting to look at as well. Uh, and the big news that no one's noticed is that Paul McCartney has now got some ownership back of his Beatles songs. This is this is big. Mm -hmm. This yeah, is yeah, big. Yeah. The, the copyright credit for songs published up to 1964 is now MPL Communications, that, that's Paul McCartney's mm -hmm. company, yeah. and Sony Music. Now, I don't know if it's, that's a 50-50 thing. I don't know mm -hmm. what the ratio of ownership is. It could be anything from 99-1 to 50-50. But there is a split now, and this hasn't been made public, except that if you look at credits very carefully, you mm -hmm. can see it. Um, administered in the US by MPL Inc. and Sony, administered for the world by Sony. So, the world excluding the US, that is, by Sony. So, there's, there's a carve up, there's a deal done here. Yeah, yeah. Paul's people have gone in with Sony's people, and a deal has been done. 
uh, other things as well. Um, looking at my piece of paper here, I want to hold your hand. The American copyright of that was owned by Leeds Music in the first instance. It was a guy called Lou Levy who picked up the publishing before the Beatles broke America, but he had it. So that huge selling record, four million copies, I think, I want to hold your hand, was massive for Lou Levy. Who's Lou Levy, people mm. might ask. He eventually sold it to MCA, and I now notice the credit is Songs of Universal, which I think must be what, Lou Levy's company mm -hmm. became mm -hmm. through MCA and is now Universal and Sony and Paul McCartney okay. so he's got a share in I Want to Hold Your Hand as yeah, well yeah. Love Me Do which was Ardmore and Beechwood an American company that had an English arm mm. which is instrumental in the Beatles being signed to George Martin in the first place when Paul McCartney was doing one of his uh, contract negotiations with EMI for as a recording artist in the 1970s he said emi owned ardmore and beechwood he said i want the copyright in love me do and ps i love you or i'm not signing with you as an artist and emi wasn't in the habit of giving away its copyrights but just went well we want paul mccartney don't we <laughs> so they ended up those two songs were became mpl communications if you look at reissues of love me do from 82 onwards it says copyright mpl mm. Now it's MPL and Lenono Music. So he's, Yoko's lawyer has obviously got involved and said, hang on a minute, what right did you have to buy Lennon and McCartney's song without us knowing it? And I don't think they did. Mm -hmm. I might be wrong on that, but certainly they didn't have a share in it. Yeah. Now they do. So copyrights are ownership is still fluid. Shifting around. It's still yes. shifting around. Yeah. And I think that the... the, the you will know better than me, but there's a 56 year rule in America that doesn't apply in the UK mm -hmm. and possibly not anywhere else because copyright rules are different in every country. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a 56 year rule in America? Copyright in America is fiendishly complicated because up until 1976 they had a process of requirement for registration. Everyone else in the world agreed in 1886 that they wouldn't have that, but America went and did their own thing in, mm. throughout the, 19, the, the, the 20th century, which means that you, if you register it, and then you have to re-register it, but then different types of work go in and out. So it's, it's, it's really, really complicated. Really complicated. Yeah. And it keeps American lawyers <laughs> in an awful lot of uh, yeah. employment. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I can't even remember, but I did a Harvard Law course online a few years ago, and that part of it, all the American music yeah. kind of stuff, this really really complicated they that's basically what they concluded at the end right so <laughs> the, the good business over there for lawyers then yeah. surprise yeah. surprise yeah I, I have books here about the the laws in the american music business up to the 1960s mm. which for the purposes of my own writing is what it's what you I, need I, I yeah. Refer to. Yeah, yeah but but since then of course it's yeah. all changed again yeah so let me just extrapolate from this if that 56 year rule applies that will explain why Paul has copyright in songs mm. in Beatles songs up to the end of 64 doesn't have sole copyright but he has part and I don't know what Yoko's side of things have done because Paul can only operate for himself but 1965 Beatles songs are going to fall under Paul's remit this year right 1966 in 2023 1967 by the time we get to 2027 Paul McCartney will have a stake in all of his Beatles songs again. Mm -hmm. The ones that he arguably hasn't had any kind of control over since 1965 um, will be back under his mm -hmm. control, or at least some share of the revenue. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's shared in the revenue anyway as a songwriter, yeah. but in terms of the publishing profit, which yeah. would be immense, mm -hmm. um, he's going to have that again. So, But I, I yes, imagine very him, it's less about eking out a living because he's doing fairly well uh, but more, right. more about the the principle of it I guess he, yes. he used to yes. say to, he used to make a when Lou Gray before Michael Jackson got them he used to make a public plea to uh, try and embarrass Lou Gray publicly mm -hmm. by saying give me back my babies Lou oh, okay. which of course was never going to happen right. um, and it, those who have studied that period of, of the Northern Song Saga will tell you that Paul did have an opportunity or two in the 1980s to get it mm -hmm. before Michael Jackson stepped in. Yeah. But for one reason or another, he didn't get mm -hmm. it, but he could have done. Um, 
I was actually with Paul on the day when Michael Jackson did the deal with Sony. And that was the day that Paul said in the kitchen of his recording studio, I remember it quite vividly, I'll never get them back now. Wow. And yet, wow. And yet now he has. Yeah. How amazing to be, yeah. actually be there at yeah. that time. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, yeah, because it was, it was like it, it got taken one further removed from the possibility mm. that day. And I think he'd read it in the news like anybody else had read it in the news. From my memory, I think there was, that McCartney did take legal action in 2018 that precipitated that and was then looking at the right jurisdiction in order to have, and went to the US in order to take advantage of the duration. Yes. Because had it happened in the UK, in this thing called, I can't remember exactly what the legal term is, but you look around for the jurisdiction which favours you most and that's where you want to take action. And obviously legal, yes. uh, Paul's got pretty good lawyers. Yes. So <laughs> I, I think that's what precipitated this. But it's in, I, I actually haven't followed what happened next and to yeah. see that that's yes. how it's manifesting itself yeah. sort of Paul claiming that stake again to his uh, and the election. second the second headline that also hasn't been written and <clears throat> made headlines numerous well on whenever Paul McCartney tried to reverse the credit on certain Beatles songs to McCartney Lennon yes. that made the news mm. yeah the fact that he's now done so in his lyrics book hasn't made the news and I don't know why I just I don't know why people aren't looking at it somehow no. People aren't noticing what's there literally in black and white. But most of the songs in that book are now credited to McCartney Lennon. Mm, that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. You're no changing it around when I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> You're assuming you're going yeah. first. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I'm just observing all of this and I, I, I raise it not in any way to... to to put anybody down or to say, well, look mm. what they're up to. No, no. It's all there in black and white. And all I'm saying is, this is interesting. It's it is really interesting, yeah. isn't it? And it mm. talks about the concepts of authorship and ownership and, and how people feel about intellectual property rights and yes. how much, mm. you know, to what extent are they your babies or yeah. not? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. Mark, we've taken up so, far more time than <laughs> we'd, uh, you know, I, told you it was going to be. Did, but, yeah, I just yeah, wondered yeah. whether I had a little bit of a fanboy moment. Could I possibly get some uh, signatures on this? As you can see, well thumbed. I went poured through this when I was a teenager, your uh, complete recording sessions. Yes. Um, I've also got this uh, chronicle. I don't know whether this is of any interest, but actually someone gave me as a gift. Oh, how uh, nice. So, I've got, so I, I so keep this as a, a treasured um, New Musical Express Paul Winner's All-Star Concert Programme, and I keep it rather than, rather than on display, I keep in it page. in the page where you've chronicled what actually happened at that event. So. Stick it in the book, as they yeah. say in Liverpool, stick it in the book. <laughs> um, who, who owns the copyright in my signature? Uh, well, uh, you wouldn't own copyright in it as a literary work. You could argue that your signature is an artistic work, but more likely you would claim your signature, if you stylized it and turned it into an image, would be protected by as, as a trademark. Right. Yeah. Okay. Just interesting. Okay. You know, I've never thought of the question <laughs> no, until no, now. No. When, when, you, when you sign a book, what happens, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so a, a, a title of a song right. cannot be predicted by copyright. Yeah. Um, and a name cannot be or a trade name. But then, so there's often people use yeah. copyright in order to enforce industrial rights. Yes. Where, in fact, design rights and trademarks are the appropriate ones. But copyright arises automatically. So then companies take advantage of that and say, oh yeah, well we own copyright in that because then they can easily prove it. Whereas trademark requires more and, and patent, patent and other intellectual yes. property rights. Yeah. As I said in Tune In, um, which I didn't know until I was doing my reading of all the music papers, um, in the year that John and Paul wrote Love Me Do, there was another song called Love Me Do, which, oh, they, right. which they must have seen. Yeah. Whether they'd heard it, I don't know, but they would have seen it in the music papers mm. as I saw it. It's just like, how interesting. So they kind of took the title. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it becomes longer and becomes a significant, well, not necessarily longer, but is a significant original creative work in its own right. So, I mean, I assume that into the latter category would fall something like Monty Python's Flying Circus. I yeah. couldn't, because also that's now trademarks as well. Yes. Course, it would be the trademark that you would be getting. It would be passing right. off something as an official Monty yeah. Python thing. Yes. It wouldn't be that the copyright protection is an infringement of the creative expression of that but it would come down to whether that phrase was a su sufficiently original literary work in its own yeah, right. Which, of course, it is. 
Yes, I think I, arguably yes. it is. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Yes. Okay. I'll sign these oh, and I'll have some cake. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. 